A proper reflection on the life and public service of Dick Luger would fill volumes. The breadth and depth of his influence on this city, on our state, our nation, on the world, is nothing short of life-changing. No tribute video measured in minutes could begin to properly cover the list of his significant achievements. And we will never know the full extent of his influence, as it will be played out for decades more in the lives of the men and women he mentored. But look and listen as we try to capture the essence of this public life. Born in 1932, Dick Luger is the oldest of Marvin and Bertha Luger's three children. He grew up in Indianapolis, but maintained a strong connection to his family's farm in southwest Marion County. The farm gave Luger one of his first lessons in the unpredictability of life, when he and his brother Tom invested their hard-earned $15 in an acre of winter wheat. So we put our whole fortune in this, and uh, we were sitting there going to church one Sunday, and Dad said, I've got bad news. The flood took off the wheat field, and it's all gone. And, and so we thought that Dad uh, meant that he had had some bad luck, but he was going to give us our $15 back. Uh, but we were wrong. Uh, we, we lost the whole thing. And he said, that's the risk you take if you're a farmer. As a young man, Dick Luger learned what it meant to stick with something until success was achieved, like earning the rank of Eagle Scout. He graduated from Short Ridge High School at the top of his class and went on to Denison University in Granville, Ohio. Well, I had a great fraternity experience in Beta Theta Pi at Denison University. That was important uh, for me because I saw all kinds of people that I've never seen since or before. Uh, I think everybody I've seen in world politics I saw in the Beta House during those four years. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, although Animal House was not precisely what happened in my fraternity experience, it was pretty close. <laughs> it, it was so close that uh, I fell off the chair with laughter and my sons who were in fraternities at the time were embarrassed to go see that in the theater, which we did on several occasions. At Denison, he met the love of his life, Charlene Smelzer. They were co-presidents of the senior class, forming a partnership that would last a lifetime. He graduated at the top of his class again and earned a Rhodes Scholarship. After graduation, he set sail for Pembroke College at Oxford. When I was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, I heard others discussing the fact that military service ought not to be for them, that uh, they were very able people, and it would be a tragedy if they were to lose their lives or even lose their time in military service. Uh, I became more and more disturbed by those conversations. I felt they were inappropriate for people to whom much has been given, and they really impelled my decision not even to wait until I came back to the United States, but to go to the American Embassy while I was there and to volunteer for the United States Navy. As it, it happened, why Admiral Burke, who was in the Chief of Naval Operations, found four young people. I was one of them, fortunate enough to be a briefer. And in due course, this led me to be at his side during the Lebanese crisis and the Taiwan Straits crisis, and uh, to watch power being exercised by a master. He was a mentor for me with regard to how America as a world power makes a difference. Marvin Luger ran the family business until his untimely death in 1956, thrusting Dick and Tom Luger into the breach. Fresh from completing their military service and in their mid-twenties, the Luger brothers brought new energy to the bakery machinery manufacturer and the family farm. It was a situation in which we opened up the plant gates in the morning and, and closed them at night, turned the lights on and off. Uh, we did everything. There wasn't anybody else. The fact is there aren't streams of accountants and attorneys and managers. You, you do it yourself or it doesn't happen. Luger's talents were soon noticed by his neighbors and his sense of duty beckoned. People came to me uh, on the west side of Indianapolis, asked me to run for the school board in uh, 1963. And Sharon and I talked a lot about this, our obligation. 
and um, conscience made me do it. Luger won the seat on the school board where he became a leader in dealing with contentious issues. But it was clear to him that solving those problems meant tackling the larger issues facing the city. So he stepped up to the next challenge. In 1967, at age 35, he was elected mayor of Indianapolis over long political odds. He was caricatured as the Boy Scout mayor. Uh, frequently throughout my life, uh, uh, many friends, for that matter, some people who didn't uh, care for me have felt that I was uh, too thoughtful or too kind, too gentle, really, to be an effective leader, to administer the very difficult situations that I had to. Uh, that, that was true when I was mayor of Indianapolis. I, as a 35-year-old man without a how to do it manual coming into that office, cartoons pictured me in a Boy Scout uniform and with the city pals, the city slickers, the people uh, all loaded for bear, really ready to clean up on a citizen amateur. But that really never turned out to be the case. Uh, the, the same Pauls in due course were cheering the fact that strong leadership came in Indianapolis that uh, really set the stage for urban leadership at a very tough time throughout the country. Indianapolis did not blow up and it was not to say that we didn't ha that it wasn't a very difficult time for everybody. I literally was going into church basements and street corners and reporting to the people uh, night by night. Dick was always there always visible, uh, never worried about his own safety, just wanted to reassure people that everything was being done, that we cared, that there were going to be brighter days ahead. Not only did Indianapolis come through the civil rights era without the scars of so many American cities, Luger led a community resurgence in the capital city. A key component to that rebirth was a government reorganization plan that he championed called UNIGOV. That was an experiment that said that, that a city can remain whole, that it can have a vital center as well as vital neighborhoods and suburbs, as opposed to being a hollowed out shell like so many cities were and have become. Following eight years as mayor, Luger was once again called to higher office. He took his talents and his experience to the United States Senate where two overarching ideals guided his actions. First, economic growth depends on the private sector creating jobs. Jobs are easy to talk about and hard to produce. Uh, I admire people who create jobs, and I've come to the conclusion the real issue in any campaign is what are the prerequisites for somebody to risk a single dollar to create a job or to bring about a new product, a new service, a new building. We have to have policies that encourage people to take risks and to invest money. Otherwise, there will be no jobs. They don't happen automatically. My, my liberal friends assume that people always create jobs and businesses, that they are simply there to be curbed and regulated and taxed, almost as predators against society. I look at it the other way, maybe as a farmer and a small business person, that there's risk all around us here. And therefore, we need to do everything we can to help the risk takers and to enhance really their desire to go for it. In 1979, Luger became the linchpin to saving Chrysler from bankruptcy. Joining with Democrat maverick Paul Zongas, Luger devised a dose of tough medicine for Chrysler that killed the bailout plan offered by the left and the filibuster planned by the right. I was involved to make certain the fabric of Newcastle, Kokomo, Michigan City, parts of Indianapolis and so forth that somehow came through. As chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee, Luger spearheaded passage of the revolutionary Freedom to Farm Bill, eliminating the last vestige of New Deal era programs. And this meeting of the Senate Agriculture Committee is called order. This morning I will propose modifications to the chairman's mark. To promote ag exports, he worked tirelessly for free trade a passion that brought him into prominence on foreign policy and his second overarching ideal. Prosperity at home depends on international security and peace abroad. Foreign relations is an important issue, first of all, because without our country being secure, uh, none of us are going to have any stability in our lives within this country. We, we take that for granted every day. 
At President Reagan's request, and as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Dick Lugar led the American delegation to the Philippines for the crucial 1986 election between Ferdinand Marcos and Corazon Aquino. But I had known enough about politics in Indiana to know fraud and abuse when I saw it. The miscounting of ballots, the destruction of ballots, the violence that attended that election. Over 100 people lost their lives. It needed to be called, and needed to be called while I was there. Following the election, Luger returned to Washington to convince President Reagan that Marcos had stolen the election and that Aquino was the true winner. He succeeded setting the United States on a path toward a new doctrine that rejected authoritarianism on the right as well as totalitarianism on the left. Later in 1986, this doctrine would be tested when President Reagan vetoed legislation putting economic sanctions on South Africa. Dick Lugar's voting record in the Senate made him President Reagan's number one supporter. But on this issue, he led the fight to override the president's veto, marshalling 78 votes, 12 more than needed. We are against tyranny, and tyranny is in South Africa. And we must be vigorous in that fight. We're not destroying the government. That government is self-destructing. The American people felt very strongly that narrow sanctions on the leadership of South Africa might lead to freedom for Nelson Mandela and certainly put the United States on the right side of history. The Soviet Union's economy was in tatters and its military was in disarray. Russia and the other nations emerging from the former Soviet Union held tens of thousands of nuclear warheads, millions of chemical weapons, and vast quantities of deadly pathogens, many stored in dilapidated facilities, guarded by troops who had no idea when their next paycheck was coming. The breakdown of the totalitarian state means that renegade soldiers could cart the stuff off. Luger recognized that strong leadership was urgently needed to prevent a proliferation disaster. The Russians came to me and said, we have several thousand nuclear warheads aimed at you. You've spent six trillion dollars in the Cold War trying to defend yourselves. The question is, what will you do now? Working with Senator Sam Nunn, the Democrat chairman of the Armed Services Committee, the pair proposed a radical idea. The United States would offer funding and expertise to the nations of the former Soviet Union to help safeguard and destroy their weapons of mass destruction. But this proposal was a hard sell. The administration of President George H.W. Bush gave no support to the idea, and Congress had little enthusiasm for helping America's former enemies. Against the odds, Luger and Nunn went to work to convince a skeptical Congress. That is an ICBM with one warhead. That we're trying to use the non Luger funding to achieve. They succeeded in passing non Luger by an 86 to 8 vote in the Senate, an outcome that Congressional Quarterly called a remarkable last minute turnaround. I remember one time being asked to go up to Sev Mash to see six Typhoon submarines. I was the first American to go up to that base which had been super secret. Typhoon submarines had 200 nuclear weapons each. They were up and down our Atlantic coast for about 15 years with just a chip shot into New York City or Washington that could have destroyed everybody. Thank goodness they didn't fire them, and thank goodness now they were asking me to help destroy them. This is crucial work. This is not simply uh, some type of enthusiasm for foreign policy. This is the security of our country. And finally, coming full circle to a constant that, if you didn't know him, might seem out of place, but isn't. My dad purchased the farm that we have now in Marion County 
Uh, this was his pride and joy, and he got help from his dad to buy it. I love farming because it makes a difference in my life. With really the, the lifestyle of people who grow up on farms, as I had the opportunity to do it as, as a part of my boyhood, uh, made a big difference in terms of my growth and the people that I was around. The walnuts are not uh, tolerant of competition. The problem is to get the weeds down, get the competing bushes out of the way. I, I keep the books, I make the crop plan. I try to understand what it may take in terms of new yields, new research, new methods, new marketing plans to make that farm go. This is a, a farm that I love. It's a farm I hope to pass along to my four sons and their children. We note our great men by their achievements, and we may certainly do that with Richard G. Luger. But to truly measure a person's impact on history, we must imagine what if. What if he hadn't come this way? Would we be sitting at a state museum in downtown Indianapolis? Would there even be a downtown Indianapolis? What if the National School Lunch Program had been eliminated? What if Mandela isn't freed? What if Marcos stays in power? What if Sam Nunn has no partner? And on and on. So many times, he has been the indispensable man, and we and the world are so much better for it.